Hello, I'm Jerry Gann and welcome to this month's edition of the Rural Doctors Programme. In this programme we're going to be focusing on ears. Professor Harvey Coates spoke with Dr Olga Ward about a range of issues regarding ears, hearing and infection. Harvey, welcome to the programme. Well, thank you very much, Olga. Harvey, otitis media is very common, but also quite controversial in general practice. What's the latest on whether or not to use antibiotics? There's been li very little change in the last five or ten years in the management of this. So uh, essentially, if you feel you're absolutely sure of the diagnosis and there's a bulging red drum and the child has, is quite sick, then you give them uh, an antibiotic and normally it would be amoxicillin, VD and 90 milligrams per kilogram per day. However, if the child's um, only mildly ill and there isn't really a bulging drum and you're not 100% sure, it is reasonable to give 48 hours of symptomatic treatment with paracetamol um, and supportive measures and give the parents a script for the amoxicillin. The child gets better, then you don't need to fill the script, and obviously if the child gets worse, you do fill the script. Um, however, it's different in children under age two or at-risk children, like perhaps uh, Aboriginal children. And in that case, usually if there's a bulging drum and the child's febrile, then we will go ahead and give uh, oral antibiotics. We were always told that macrolides didn't penetrate terribly well into the middle ear. Is that really true? And if it is, what would you recommend for the penicillin allergic kid who cross reacts to cephalosporin? The macrolides aren't well absorbed in the middle ear, but interestingly enough, they are one of the two groups of antibiotics that are absorbed intracellularly when bacteria uh, within the uh, interior of the cell, which our research has shown recently, and therefore macrolides and uh, ciprofloxacin, even though it's not normally recommended orally for kids under 12, is uh, an alternative. However, in the child who normally has no allergies, you go either amoxicillin or more severe illness, um, amoxicillin clavulinic acid. If they're allergic to both cephalosporins and amoxicillin, then you either have a choice of septrin uh, or you can go with azithromycin, which has the advantage of being a once a day dosage. And it's certainly used quite a bit in the Northern Territory. When patients present with recurrent otitis media, when should we think about referring them to a specialist for assessment? Once again, the, um, the latest guidelines from the AAP show that it's important if a child has had three to four ear infections in six months that are severe, or four or five in 12 months, that they should be referred to an ENT surgeon for consideration of grommet insertion. Particularly the child who has glue or otitis media with effusion the whole time and that fluid's getting recurrently infected the uh, optimal management is almost always inserting grommet tubes. And nowadays we tend to do adenoidectomy as well uh, because that reduces the need for a second lot of grommets by about 50%. With the children with recurrent acute otitis media, I think the children that are most at risk nowadays, apart from the Aboriginal children, are children who go to daycare. Daycare is the main cause of the mini epidemic of otitis media in glue ear in the last 50 years. And this is because of biologic zoos, the kids uh, get three times as many upper respiratory tract infections as a child that's at home and they also have multiple ear infections. So in fact in the average daycare 21 percent of children have grommets in their ears, those who are attending full-time. In family daycare, full time, it's about 3%. And kids at home, it's less than 1%. So it is a major risk factor. Are the pathogens that affect children's ears different from the ones that turn up in adults? Uh, interestingly enough, probably they are. I think in adults, pneumococcus is the most uh, common agent, streptococcus pneumoniae. Uh, in children, because of the Prevnar vaccination over the last 10 years or so, 
the most common organism now is Haemophilus influenzae, followed by Moraxella, and uh, Strep pneumoniae is third. So there, there is a difference, and that's due to the uh, childhood immunisation. Does that lead to any difference in progression with the disease? We, we feel that possibly the, the more severe diseases associated with Strep pneumoniae, uh, but obviously because of the station tube size, adults get much less otitis media than children. Um, uh, Haemophilus, however, is a fairly um, significant pathogen and, and this is why it's being addressed now with some of the newer uh, vaccines. I think probably that children have the worst progression of disease and particularly the Aboriginal children um, just because of their underlying eustachian dysfunction and uh, their high load and burden of, uh, of disease and bacteria. I often think that that's something to do with their tiny little sinuses as well as their horizontal eustachian tubes. Um, do you see any difference with kids with fetal alcohol syndrome? The, these children are small. I think probably the biggest risk factor in kids that I see is um, the child, uh, the Aboriginal children, because they have an adenoid full of bacteria and they get loaded with these by age 12 weeks. So there's almost 100% uh, gross colonisation by pneumococci at uh, age 12 weeks and we've found and, and obviously it's not a, a surgical solution and, um, is that removing the adenoids on children really reduces in 50,000 grommet children that were followed in WA uh, by 50% the second lot of grommets. Uh -huh. So I guess they can ventilate more easily just Absolutely. from a space yes. point and of view ventilate and also there isn't that load of bacteria sitting there just by the eustachian tube entrance. So do you see any benefit from pneumococcal and hip vaccination since they've been introduced universally? Yes, uh, there's a modest improvement in uh, otitis media reduction, only about 6% with the pneumococcal vaccination. Uh, people are trying another vaccination which is a combination of an anti um, pneumococcal vaccine and also an anti haemophilus vaccine and we're waiting with interest to see what the results of this trial will show. Um, I feel that HIV um, because it only has helped almost eradicate um, epiglottitis in children. Uh, I haven't seen a case for 10 or 15 years but it because the otitis media uh, organism is haemophilus in multivariate types or multi-species type uh, and non-specific, uh, it's not helped by HIV. The Synflurex uh, medication or vaccine contains a 10-valent um, pneumococcal vaccine but also an anti-D, uh, the covering of the haemophilus uh, mm -hmm. bacteria. So it's believed to act on both of these and since the introduction, as I mentioned earlier, of the Prevnar vaccination, the prevalence of pneumococcal disease has gone down to number three instead of being number one and Haemophilus is now number one. So if you can have a dual attack as they're trying in New Guinea and in the Northern Territory, it may be of some use. Right. So this is a vaccine that's still under trial to see if it makes it better? It's, it's being used in some countries uh, as a standard treatment. In fact, I think it's standard treatment uh, for the third vaccination in Northern Territory. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as uh, influenza vaccine is concerned, yes, it does have an influence. If you can reduce the influenza, then you might reduce the um, flu vax, uh, virus that comes along and that might precipitate otitis media or cause a biofilm that contains a middle ear uh, bacteria to become planktonic and then cause an ear infection. What other measures would you recommend as being effective? In, in uh, acute otitis media I think probably the only extra medications one might give if the eardrum hasn't perforated would be to use some form of local anaesthetic on the eardrum drops. Uh, I think Orelgin is one brand that's used, but it shouldn't be used if there's a discharge. Uh, obviously paracetamol. I don't feel that decongestants or nasal sprays uh, make any difference in the treatment of this. However, with 
otitis media with effusion, something like 40% of West Australian children are atopic. And I do find that if I'm trying to clear the middle ear, the same lining lining the eustachian tube lines the nose. And if you can give them uh, a nasal steroid spray, particularly one with a low absorption, you will actually make a difference as far as I've seen in my practice in the last 15, 20 years, you may well uh, clear that middle ear of fluid. So I think that is a worthwhile adjunct. The nasal steroid spray that I recommend is uh, one called Mometazone or Nasonex because it's got 0.1% cortisone absorption. So you're not going to affect the pituitary adrenal axis. Whereas some of the others like Beclomethazone have a 40% uh, absorption and actually will affect over a longer period of time, like a year, the child's growth. Harvey, when does otitis media turn into glue ear? Now, this happens probably at or about a month after the acute otitis media. So if a child gets an acute otitis media, 60% still have fluid in their middle ear yeah. at a month and about 30% at two months. Mm -hmm. And with time, and with a secretion of various glycoproteins from the middle ear wall and also something we've discovered in Perth, the neutrophil extracellular traps, the DNA uh, accumulates in large quantities and that accounts for the thickening of the fluid and where it becomes glue-like. Mm -hmm. And when we suck it out, it's like honey or, or chewing gum uh, when we do our meringotomy tubes. So that's when it happens. and. I think from the general practitioner's point of view, you've got to be aware that there is a sequela called otitis media with effusion that can happen after an acute otitis media and if it's still there at three months and the child has a hearing loss or balance issues or ongoing pain or recurrent acute otitis media, then we have to consider referral for further management. But if you see some fluid at a month, you can just sit there and watch it for a couple of months? Absolutely. And do you manage Indigenous children any differently from the rest of the population when it comes to just an acute otitis media? Absolutely. I think we're more aggressive with Aboriginal children because their degree of uh, disease is worse and the sequelae are more serious. And many Aboriginal children have their first ear infection by age three months. And certainly their uh, prevalence of ear disease is much, much higher than it is in the outside population. And the sequelae, such as the fact that the average Aboriginal child has 32 months of hearing loss and glue ear in their childhood, as opposed to three months for the non-Aboriginal child, is very significant. And of the 106,000 Australians that are supposed to have, that, are, that have um, middle ear disease with perforation of their tympanic membrane, the large proportion of those are Aboriginal children. And this is a major cause of pathology, hearing loss, speech delay, uh, truancy, school issues and so forth. Dr Deborah Lehman is an epidemiologist interested in the causal pathways in otitis media and lower respiratory infections. She recently headed a health promotion study in the goldfields regarding otitis media. We spoke with her about that study and to get her advice about the management of otitis media. He's had uh, the last two nights, he's been up screaming throughout the night and um, then this morning I noticed discharge coming out of his right ear and um, uh, he's been rubbing out his ears. Um, Is there redness? Around? Is his ear red? Um, yeah. But my, most of all, the biggest giveaway was the was the discharge and the um, the screaming. At the Otitis media is a, a major cause of illness, both to Aboriginal people and to non-Aboriginal people, um, and it's the most common reason for which antibiotics are prescribed. So. Um, the more antibiotics you prescribe, the more risk of getting antibiotic resistance and so it's harder to treat the disease. Um, almost every child uh, gets at least one episode of ear infections, uh, of an ear infection before the age of three. Twenty percent of children under one get more than, uh, get, uh, more than one infection, get three episodes. Uh, for the Aboriginal population the problem is 
uh, is much more serious. They get the disease very early in life. They, um, they get it more severely and often it has no symptoms. So therefore that doesn't prompt uh, the parent to take the child for treatment. Uh, they also are more likely to get a perforated eardrum and the long-term consequences of uh, otitis media. Uh, so for both the populations, so the, um, the disease is uh, a major problem. Uh, the impact of this disease is enormous. It affects speech, it affects uh, language development, and that infects schooling which can then lead to problems in later life and it's even been linked with the justice system, with um, contact with the justice system. So a really, really important disease and the general practitioners of the, know this and, uh, and uh, they are the first port of call. Look, it may well be, I'll have a look in a minute, but if he does have another eardrum problem, then yeah. I'll have a look in a minute. Yeah. Especially if he's getting a discharge and there has been a perforation of the eardrum again, then yeah. that's, that'll be his third yeah. in, within his a year. year. Yeah. Um, and it's likely then that we should probably send him for further investigations, look to a specialist. So most of the work that I've done has been in the, in the gold fields. And we've done a fairly unique study, uh, well actually it's the only one worldwide where we've looked at both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people living in the same uh, environment. Uh, so we enrolled 100 Aboriginal babies at birth and 100 non-Aboriginal babies at birth and then we followed them several times for, uh, up to the age of two years. Um, and we wanted to know what were the factors that were predisposing some children to um, getting an ear infection and not others. And uh, we collected samples from the nose because uh, bacteria and viruses are very important uh, in the etiology of um, otitis media. And we also looked at things like how many people are living in the house, etc. So, um, some of the key findings are that uh, children um, are getting the disease, as I said, that the Aboriginal kids are getting the disease really early. So even the first month of life, they're getting the disease and they're getting it before they're even eligible for a vaccination at the age of two months. Um, the peak prevalence, the highest rate of disease under two years is in the um, about uh, six to 11 months, so that's in the order of 70%, and then it continues on from there uh, in, in the Aboriginal population. The non-Aboriginal population, 40% of children we examined, these were children at a, like a routine clinic, not with any symptoms, 40% of them had some evidence of uh, ear infection. Uh, in the Aboriginal population, 40% of children between six and 17 months had moderate to severe hearing loss. So you can imagine the impact of that uh, on long-term development. Um, there's been a lot of work in the past from the Menzies School of Health Research in Darwin, uh, looking at the, the bacteria that are causing disease and how much there is. And again, these children are, the Aboriginal children are getting the bacteria really early in life. Um, and this, this is probably key to, um, to the, the uh, disease burden. That kind of recurrent infection can have flow-on effects. Right. So you can get um, some hearing loss or yeah. it can get delayed speech. You can, so Actually, I have kind of noticed that he's not, he's not speaking, um, he's not developing his vocabulary as early as his brothers. Yeah. Um, did, yeah, so he may already have a bit of a speech um, delay. The, the best thing we can do then is get him <laughs> to people who specialise in exactly that yeah. and, and um, to make sure that those sorts of development milestones are... There are three major bacteria, the Streptococcus pneumoniae, Haemophilus influenzae, that's the non-type of Haemophilus influenzae, not the Hib that you have a vaccine for, and Moraxella cateralis. Um, and there are also um, viruses. Uh, for example, the, vi the virus um, 
called the rhinovirus, which is like the common cold, that actually increases the risk of carrying, um, carrying another bacteria, carrying a bacteria as well. Um, so those are important. Smoking exposure to environmental tobacco smoke was a very important factor um, for, um, as a risk factor for both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal kids. Daycare is a risk factor in um, the non-Aboriginal population. There are not really enough Aboriginal kids who go to daycare um, to, for us to analyse that data. But in fact, their homes are often like, like daycare. Crowding was the most consistent and most important factor in terms of increased risk of carrying um, bacteria in the nose and that subsequently leading to, um, to otitis media. Um, and we actually looked at the number of rooms uh, in the house and uh, risk of carriage and if you increase the number of rooms in the house, the lower the carriage. So this is an absolutely crucial factor that housing is, has to be addressed uh, in, in preventing um, otitis media. Let me just have a look in the other ear, Chase. I just want to look in that ear, okay? Do you want to this way? Okay. Just let me have a look in there. Good boy. Yeah, not too much. There is a little bit of inflammation okay. there as well. Um, so clearly there's We've actually made a very nice uh, um, diagram of the, what we call the causal pathways to otitis media, really pointing out that this, uh, it's, uh, we've got to have a multifaceted approach to uh, dealing with, with otitis media. So on the one hand, we want to prevent the disease. In the case of Aboriginal people, it's got to be really, really in there before they're born, you know, and those aspects. Um, and, um, and the GPs, it, they, they will see the, the patient, they will decide whether they need antibiotics or not, and that's again, there's debates about that. Um, I think more and more GPs are saying, well, here's a script, if your child isn't better in two, two days, then uh, give an antibiotic, because there are viruses that won't, you know, that are causing otitis media that won't, necessarily, um, that antibiotics won't do anything for. So getting the antibiotics to the children and really making sure that the antibiotics are being taken, and that's probably a hard, a hard task. Um, and so in terms of dealing with those things, maybe what we need to move to is towards an ear health coordinator type position. And we've actually, there's been one appointed in the gold fields to really get support uh, health workers and nurses into the management and diagnosis of otitis media and the referral to either GPs or ear specialists. And I think this works well in, in places like New Zealand and I think more and more people are going towards this. So what, what sorts of things would they do if...? Well, there's, there's a number of different things. The, the gold standard yep. treatment at the moment would be to put grommets in the ears. Okay. Um, is he in daycare at the moment? Yeah, he is. He is. Yeah. Um, that increases the risk mm -hmm. of ear infection a lot, yeah. hugely. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, a really substantial number of kids who are going to daycare now have yeah. problems in their ear. Yeah, okay. um, uh, one of the problems in, in the rural areas also is a severe lack of both audiologists and ear specialists. So, like in the gold fields, only the ear specialist at the moment can only get out there or to the Aboriginal population three, four times a year. There's no other funding. There's no resident audiologist. So this is, this is a real problem for the GPs. So I think there should be more training of, uh, and that, that has already started through, um, through NACHO, the National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation. So they have training programs for Aboriginal health workers. Um, and they're, so they're beginning to, they can, they're being trained to look in ears, to do tympanometry and to do audiometry. And I think that's the way we have to go. I think we have to go with people who are going to stay in the area. And they can screen and then if, if there's a concern. Um, I mean, one example is we picked up a, a child who had congenital hearing loss that had somehow been missed, you know, just by regular screening or being out there. and. 
and talking to people. Um, the other opportunities are telemedicine and that's becoming more and more popular and there are um, I think two uh, ear specialists in WA who are doing that at least uh, and that's a really good opportunity to uh, get advice. All right, that sounds good. What are your chances of getting down to Perth to see someone or do you... <laughs> That would be pretty hard. <laughs> it's yeah. just started the school term. Um, okay. If it was school holidays, that might be. There is, um, look, I'll make a note of a couple of specialists for you, but there is also um, a visiting uh, audiologist oh. and a visiting ENT, in nose and throat surgeon. Oh, that would be great. Um, and I'll have a look at what he scheduled. One thing that can be done is every time you see a child is look in the ear, and that's particularly in the in the Aboriginal population. So, so, and also ask the parent: Have they any concerns about the child's hearing? Then parents usually know if they have a problem. Parents talk about, oh, you know, that's, um, you know, they don't want to hear me. You know, that's subjective uh, hearing loss. But uh, certainly in the first year or two of life, uh, parents will will know if the child's in hearing. But that's, so that's really something a GP can do, saying, have you got any concerns about your hearing? And every time you see that child, every time a child gets an immunization, so have a look in the ears and see what, they're, um, what it's like. And I think you know, health promotion as well is part of a, a GP's role. So uh, promotion about smoking. If you do smoke, keep your kids away from it. Hand hygiene is extremely important, so if you um, promote regular hand washing uh, because of all the bacteria that are causing um, disease, it moves. We've, we've actually picked up um, bacteria on the hands, um, so that's obviously transmitted. We need a multifaceted approach. There isn't one, uh, one thing that uh, will fix all. Uh, we need to address major social and environmental issues. So housing is a major issue in the Aboriginal population. Um, we need to uh, make sure that uh, children are diagnosed with otitis media, so they have a diagnosis, uh, that they, so therefore they need to have regular ear examinations. We need to provide the appropriate antibiotics and uh, we need to find some better vaccines. And we'll see how that responds, but if, it, if he's not responding to that medication, yeah. then just uh, give us a call yeah. here and bring him straight back in. Yeah. 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 Okay, great. Thanks, Thanks very much. All right, come on, Jason. We're going to go to the pharmacy Bye. now Bye. and get you some medicine. Okay, come on. And our thanks to Dr. Lehman from the Telethon Institute for her time. Now let's return to the discussion with Professor Coates and Dr. Olga Ward. Could you talk us through tympanometry? It's a gadget that we, some general practices have, but that we don't use a great deal. Is it useful yeah. in GP practice? Absolutely. Tympanometer is one of the, the, the greatest aids um, to those of us and they, it's useful in children over the age of six months or if you have a specialised one under the age of six months. And this measures the movement and compliance or compliance of the eardrum. So a normal eardrum with pressure on it will move like this. So as I'll show you in some demonstrations, we've got an A tympanogram which is a normal tympanogram with a, a peak. It looks like a tent. Now, if the A tympanogram is fairly flat but peaked, that implies there may be fluid in the middle ear or a stiffened eardrum. And if it's very tall, like a teepee, then it may imply that there's a flaccid eardrum and that may be an eardrum that's had previous uh, infections and has, there's a retraction pocket or it's weakened. Um, a B tympanogram is flat a low volume B tympanogram usually means glue ear or a very thickened eardrum as we see in some Aboriginal children. One with a high volume uh, above say one, one and a half uh, centimetres means that there's a perforation of the eardrum. If you've got a type C, that looks like a tent that's falling over, uh, 
that implies eustachian tube dysfunction. Now there are variations on that, but it is very useful adjunct and um, I, I use it all the time. A lot of people say, why don't you use uh, a pneumatic otoscopy? But children on the whole don't like you blowing air in and out on their eardrum, particularly small children. I've noticed that. And there's a learning curve as well, whereas with tympanometry, once you're comfortable with it, it's, uh, it's like riding a bike. Well, Harvey, I quite often see some patients for ear syringing four or even six times a year. And, uh, you know, I mean, ear syringing is fantastic. You produce this easy cure, the patient yeah. goes out with a grin on their mush, but what makes some people so susceptible to wax buildup? And is there something we can do to prevent them having to come in? Yeah, that's a hard one. Um, there are two types of wax. There's a wet wax, which we see in people, uh, Caucasian people and people from Africa. And there's a dry wax, which we see in people of Asian background. Now, these wax cells are produced in the outer third of the ear canal. Um, the wax accumulates the cerumen. And in some people, if they've got um, excess production or if they have a uh, Coke bottle ear canal, so it's narrower on the outside, the wax will accumulate and not come out easily. Some people, unfortunately, use cotton buds and they ram it in up they against sure their eardrum. Uh, so that's one of my uh, hobby horses, but we'll come to another one later. So um, I'm very concerned that there's a trend now to disallow nurses and even some doctors are saying they don't want to use uh, ear syringing to wash the wax out. Um, and so nurses that have been doing it for 20 years are not using it and the, um, they've been told not to. And so we're going to try and uh, approach this problem. So I would recommend uh, 10 or 20 mil syringe with the end of a giving set uh, of a scalp vein needle to so a very soft little one and wash the ear out with warm water so they don't get dizzy. Um, and I think that's very safe. If there's a hole in the ear, um, then you have to be very careful. You may want to send them to an ENT surgeon or you may just gently syringe with 0.5% uh, betadine, one in 20 solution of betadine, which should be safe and not cause infection. Mm. I find well, they're that difficult to know, of course, if there's are, a perforation not, behind the wax. Well, exactly, and that's where your tympanogram can help if it's, the wax isn't impacted. It'll tell you if mm. there's a, a hole behind or not. Um, many of the over-the-counter uh, preparations like uh, ceramol and waxol don't work. They soften the wax, but they don't let it come out. By far the best is uh, Prof Max Kamian's uh, solution of a half level teaspoonful of sodium bicarbonate and 15 mils of warm water, five drops daily for a week, and that will dissolve and remove most of the wax. So that's the best solution. So for patients with very narrow ear canals, or I still see patients with some osteomas in their ear canal, um, would you recommend that for them or will they get the, the fluid stuck behind there as well? Well, that's a problem. I think. Osteomas or exostoses um, need to be kept an eye on because if they grow so large, particularly in Western Australia, the highest incidence in the world because people swim in cold water all the time, all year round, and the, uh, the exostoses grow and grow and then water gets trapped behind and then it swells or the cerumen swells and they get an otitis externa or they get hearing loss. When they get to that stage, it becomes a surgical problem and you have to actually drill those out. But um, I think probably the best idea then is to keep water out. I mean, otitis externa itself is a disease of prevention. You either have to stop the water getting in or after they've gone swimming, use something like aqua ear. Including for showering, I guess, for people who've got really severe obstruction. Absolutely, I think they must keep water out. Mm. Well, look, I occasionally see a child or an adult that has been using an ear candle and I have also seen wax burns on the ear canal from such items and they do sound rather like hokum to me. Are they hokum? Absolutely. If you grab a, 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 an ear candle before they use it 
and break it. There's the brown stuff in the middle which they claim is a wax that's been sucked up. They even say that it sucks fluid from glue ear through the eardrum, which is rubbish. <laughs> ear candling is child abuse. And anyone who treats a child with ear candles it could be subject to litigation if the child gets burns on their face, occlusion of the ear canal, perforation of the eardrums. All of these have been seen in Canada and the US. What about those syringe yourself kits that the patients buy? Well, I've only seen these used once and it was by a uh, outstanding nurse in Fitzroy Crossing who used these to great success. So that's the only time I've seen or heard of their use. Um, and I think if the flow is appropriate and the eardrum's not thin, that they probably are reasonably safe. All of those commonly available eardrops contain no antifungals or just nice statin. Um, I guess that's useful for candida, but quite a lot of the patients seem to have aspergillus infections in their ear. And, you know, they've got that wet, soggy paper with the little black dots on it that looks horrendous. Can we just use normal eardrops for that? Or do I have to go to the vet and get the dog ones that have got um, <laughs> clotrimazole or something in it? No, <laughs> that's uh, interesting. What happens when you see that either a, a, that blotting paper or wet newspaper in the ear canal, that is classical either uh, candida or aspergillus niger um, fungal uh, infection. That should be managed by meticulously removing that or washing it out with betadine and then following it up with an antifungal uh, antibacterial eardrop. And the one I recommend is lococortin vioform rather than using kenicomb. Why? Because kenicomb, the patients come back and say, my infection's gone, doctor, but I can't hear because yeah, it sits down in the cul-de-sac and it glugs up and prevents the eardrum moving. So lococortin vioform is less viscous. Mm -hmm. It's not, there's no resistance issues with it because it's, it's an antibacterial it? rather than a, um, uh, uh, an antibiotic. Yep, and when you're back, back to this, you were talking about syringing, it's the one in 20 solution of betadine. Correct. Um, speaking of 1 in 20 betadine, do people still use tissue spears? Yes, they do. In the Northern Territory um, and in some other areas, people are using tissue spears more and, and using the uh, betadine near toilets less, which is a real worry. In fact, when I went to work in the intervention in uh, the east uh, part of uh, the Northern Territory, when I bought out a syringe with betadine in it, the children disappeared because they thought I was going to give them a shot. Oh. So, in fact, what's happening is that I've been uh, going on about this for so long. We're putting in an NH and MRC um, grant comparing tissue spears followed by antibiotic drops uh, against uh, betadine ear toilets followed by tissue spears followed by drops um, as uh, a treatment for children, Aboriginal children with CSOM. Uh, mm -hmm. This might make a policy change because there's such a variation and management of that. Now some of the doctors may not have actually come across a tissue spear. Do you want to just explain that? And tissue spear I just make by folding over one of the four edges and then turning it around. And you pop it in the child's ear uh, or adult's ear and leave it there for a few moments and that sucks up the uh, pus and then you repeat it with the next corner and each corner until you get a dry uh, response. Then you put the drops in. It's no use putting ear drops in on top of a sea of pus. You're not going to get the results you want with CSOM. My theory is with our, our discovery, once again in Perth, of bacterial biofilm right through the mastoid and middle ear that, and also in the secretions, that if you irrigate out, you'll dislodge that bacteria and the biofilm, which is the cause of the recalcitrance for treatment uh, with normal management, and you'll get a better result than you do with tissue spears. So speaking of perforations, as we were earlier when you were talking about syringing gently on top of what might be a perforation, are there any eardrops that would cause more damage than others, or are we just being freaked out? No, we're not being freaked out. I saw a patient last year, I know it's anecdotal, but I did every blood test, every uh, scan known to man on a child who had 10 days of Sofridex, and that child lost all hearing in that ear, which had a grommet in it. 
Obviously, the infection had gone away in three days and the most toxic antibiotic known to man, sophromycin, um, is, uh, which is neomycin B, was absorbed through the round window membrane and the child lost uh, the hearing in that ear. So mm -hmm. the two antibiotics that are available uh, the uh, ofloxacin and ciprofloxacin, the fluoroquinolones, these are non-ototoxic and they are the treatment of choice if there's a perforation. There is no real indication for using an ototoxic or potentially ototoxic antibiotic anymore. Mm -hmm. So kid with grommet, ciprofloxacin, Yes. adult with grommet or adult with perforation, ciprofloxacin. Ciprofloxacin, yeah. If there's a polyp around or granulation tissue around and it's bleeding near the polyp, which I see once a week, then Cipro HC, Ciproxin HC, the hydrocortisone helps it disappear within one to two weeks. And do you recommend, you, you mentioned aqua ear earlier and mm -hmm. those other preparations which yep. are acetic acid and alcohol pretty much, aren't they? Um, how effective are they? I and think they work quite well. How else can people dry out their ears Well, if they don't like the drops. Well, the drop, the drops can burn if there's any sign of infection or inflammation down there because it's vinegar and alcohol. The vinegar lowers the pH down towards the five which suppresses the bacteria and the alcohol mixes with any water and being hygroscopic it, it, it just disappears. That doesn't work. Some people say get a very um, low uh, uh, noise, low volume hair dryer and just aim it towards the ear and try and dry it out that way. There aren't a lot of other ways. Some people would say they, to do a tissue spear. I'm very conscious of people who have crippled ear canals from using cotton buds in and out, in and out, until they wipe away all the wax producing cells. They end up with an ear canal that's like a gun barrel, and you've seen those yeah. shiny uh, red or white ear canals and they're like a, a duck's feathers without grease. They just can't, uh, they're no longer waterproof and they get recurrent acute otitis externa for the rest of their life. Well, quite a lot of my hearing aid patients seem to end up with wax buildup and otitis externa. Is there something that you can do about those or a hot, easy tip that they can use? With the, with the, for removing the wax, I think you just use, I, I, I think if they could use either the sodium bicarbonate solution at night when they're not wearing the hearing aid and mm -hmm. try and get that out. But once again, uh, if you get moisture within the uh, hearing aid, you may well cause it to be um, non-functioning. So that is a yeah, bit of an issue. It is a bit of an issue. And yeah. sodium bic at, at night, just when they're getting wax build up, or would you just recommend they did that almost I think prophylactically? Prob I think probably they should almost do it prophylactically every couple of months, depending on how much wax they get. And, and possibly they have to go along to their family practitioner to get it cleaned out and make sure that it's cleaned several times a year. For many people, working in Indigenous health means geographic isolation and few opportunities for collaboration and peer discussion. We spoke with Rural Health West's marketing and events coordinators, Claire Underdown and Lisa Thomas, about the upcoming Aboriginal Health Conference and the opportunities it presents for those working in Aboriginal health. Rural Health West runs five conferences and each of the conferences have a, a strong focus on allowing the doctors the opportunity to network and socialise. Um, we think it provides them with the opportunity to share ideas and also to meet with other doctors in similar situations who obviously aren't in the same town. So it's a great um, chance for them to share um, any innovations they may have or uh, any new practices that are working in their particular speciality or interest area. The Aboriginal Health Conference will take place at the Pan Pacific Perth on the 6th and 7th of July. The theme this year is Aspire Together, Achieve Together. So the conference will actually be on the Saturday and Sunday and NAIDOC week commences on Sunday afternoon. Perth is the host city so there will be a lot of celebrations happening in the city that afternoon. So. Um, we're hoping that this gives you the opportunity to come down to the conference on the Saturday and Sunday and then enjoy, join in the celebrations um, that are happening in the city that afternoon. 
For Aboriginal um, health practitioners, um, the, this conference, the Aboriginal Health Conference, gives them a perfect opportunity to meet with um, fellow practitioners who are interested in that specialised area. Um, and there's a big focus on it, um, you know, politically uh, as well as from just a health outcomes um, area. So uh, it provides a great forum to talk about professional is issues outside of your work environment. Um, our conference is in Perth. We fly the um, general practitioners down, so we're happy to subsidise, noting that we know some of you live in um, areas that are a little bit out of the way. Uh, and for the Aboriginal health practitioners, um, we think it's important to get out of the workspace and, and out of a, an environment where you're always very busy and the conferences are a good opportunity to take a break as well as learn new things. The events team always looks for uh, people that can provide relevant information that may be applicable in other areas. So for example, this year we have a speaker from Canada and they have a large Indigenous population and the practices that they have over there may inspire people here to adopt some of those and they may work um, for different people in different areas. It helps you keep up to date on what other um, health departments or health practitioners are doing and might give you some ideas on ways that you can um, change or adapt your practices at work. So this year we've got Peter Braunberg, a psychiatrist from Ontario in Canada. Now he does a lot of work with the Indigenous children up in the remote areas of Canada. Um, he does a lot of through telehealth or by visiting those regions um, and he has been leading the way in actually like telehealth psychiatry and mental health, mental health issues for the Indigenous. Our other keynotes include Maureen Carter. Um, Maureen will be talking about the Fitzroy Valley Partnerships. Um, which include the, you know, Fitzroy Valley, um, Fitzroy Crossing, the, the AMS, the WACs and also the Department of Health. The biggest thing that's come out of it is um, the alcohol re restrictions in that area and Maureen was one of the key people who actually got those restrictions in place. We have also engaged Stephen Moo, um, who is from the Department of Health in the Northern Territory. Uh, Stephen does a lot of work also in telehealth um, and working between both the Northern Territory and Western Australia um, and looking at telehealth services um, in the Indigenous communities. Um, we have also um, secured Dwayne um, Everett-Smith. Uh, he's an Aboriginal health worker from Tasmania but he's also a singer-songwriter and he's the voice of the, um, the Tourism Australia's marketing campaign um, with his song It's Like Love and he'll be closing the conference with his story and also his um, a few songs. Rural Health West, uh, as many of you know, run a family support program and we recognise the importance that your spouses and also your children have uh, within your family and work balance life. So when you come to the conferences, we provide you with a family program. Um, so the annual conference, the Aboriginal Health Conference and the Fremantle Conference, the conference is all in Perth, uh, we provide activities to um, keep your spouse and your children entertained while you have the opportunity to come along and learn, learn new things or get clinical updates on, on things that interest you. Uh, the family conference this year includes um, photography, so that's photography for all ages, and we generally then give the spouses the opportunity as well to take in some of the um, nice shops in Perth, which I know some people tend to miss living in the remote areas. With this conference we do have a more casual type of a sundowner that happens so allowed delegates to actually get together and network. Um, this takes place on the Saturday afternoon after the conference. Um, this year's social event um, is called Aspiring Artists um, and we will have uh, a number of artists and performers at the social event on the Saturday afternoon. Uh, one will be an Aboriginal artist who will come to the conference, then a delegate will have the opportunity to take home her piece of work from the conference. Uh, we'll have also some musicians, um, bush tucker. Um, it's family friendly, it'll be very relaxed and it'll give you the opportunity to network and catch up with your colleagues. There's an, uh, an exhibition hall so you can also meet um, some of the pharmaceutical companies and learn about new products uh, and you can speak to your colleagues about things that they may be doing. So there's morning tea, lunch, afternoon tea scheduled into the program for you um, which then allow you more informal opportunities to talk, meet with colleagues you may not have seen for a while, meet some new colleagues who are new to the, particularly to Aboriginal health and pass on some of your great ideas. This is the leading Aboriginal health conference in Western Australia. Um, our numbers continue to grow. It is a conference that does 
offer different opportunities for people. The clinical updates and the CPD points provide, you know, for the GPs, they can come along um, and uh, also gain CPD points, they can get a clinical update while they're there, but also network with other health professionals working within Aboriginal Health. I think for um, some others, for other health professionals, it's just more of an insight um, and gives them a greater networking opportunity. Um, it's a really nice, fun, relaxed environment and it's definitely a conference that you wouldn't want to miss out on. And our thanks to Claire and Lisa. And now let's get back to our discussion with Professor Coates and Olga Ward. Well, I just had a patient back with something very exciting that I'd never seen before, and that was an implanted bone conduction hearing aid. He'd been pecked by a magpie at the age of seven and gotten completely deaf in that ear. And they've just put this thing in at the age of 50 something. And he's thrilled to bits, can hear conversation clearly for the first time in his life. Um, Lots of fancy new hearing aids on the market. Can you tell us a little bit about what our patients might be coming back with? Yes, I, I think uh, the implantable hearing aid, uh, some people don't um, particularly like the Baja because they end up with uh, a strut sticking out of the back of the head and they look a bit like Uncle Fester mm. um, from the Adams family. But uh, there's some new ones now where you actually have a magnet inside and mm. you can just put the magnet on the outside and wear the hearing aid that way without having anything, um, the, the titanium strut coming through. There are also some new ones that can be put down the ear canal that you can't see that actually transmit the sound in conductive hearing loss. And in some cases, people can actually have surgery where the, the eardrum's lifted and you actually put a small um, sound bridge which uh, works um, quite well to amplify the sound on the ossicles. Uh, so there are a lot of interesting things happening awesome. and in the uh, permanent hearing loss I guess the, the what they call the tiki, the totally implantable cochlear implant uh, is being trialled and when that works that will be fantastic. All right, Other people problems, are talking yeah. about this for, for long term older yes. people with sensory neural hearing loss. Absolutely. And children who are picked up in the early hearing assessment as having hearing loss, um, are they all likely to head on to the cochlear implant state or do they kind of come good with a little bit of uh, over the ear hearing aid from six yeah. or eight weeks of age onwards? No, it, well, the newborn hearing screening program, you've got to be aware is that one child is born deaf, um, by age five that number will have doubled because of progressive hearing loss and acquired hearing loss and it will have tripled by age 10. So that's just one test in the whole childhood and, I, and one of my hobby horses is that we should be doing, particularly in at-risk populations, hearing tests, if not uh, um, six monthly, every year to pick up these problems. But the uh, best management initially is depending on the degree of hearing loss. So if the child's got a mild hearing loss, then a hearing aid would be fine. If they've got a moderate hearing loss, a hearing aid should do fine. If it's a severe to profound hearing loss and they don't do well with hearing aids, then we're trying to get them cochlear implants as soon after six months as possible. Mm -hmm. And that's so that they will develop a normal speech Absolutely, pattern. because the neuroplasticity is such that by the age of six months, you've got to have some form of amplification going in or else that part of the brain that controls uh, the speech and language will have been taken over by other parts of the brain. Well, you've made some recommendations. Quite a lot of us work with Indigenous patients. Would you be recommending that we send them for annual hearing tests, given that they are pretty much a highest risk population? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, six monthly so. until three and then annually from then on. I mean, many children in Western Australia will have their newborn hearing screening test. The next test they get is at school. Yep. I mean, that's not, that's not on. And we have to be doing more. And are those kinds of audiology services readily available through AMSs? They are, and there is visiting Australian hearing and there are visiting um, 
uh, ENT groups right throughout uh, Western Australia, but we don't come as often as we'd like and there aren't enough audiologists regionally and we hope with uh, the increasing uh, production of audiologists through the universities that will have some that have the interest to go out and work in uh, the uh, rural and regional areas. Yeah. So as a GP, I guess for, for a child it's doing a hearing, that kind of specialised hearing test. As an adult, if you thought that somebody was suitable for a hearing aid or might require a hearing aid, what sort of pre-testing should a GP do? If a GP has been trained to do audiometry and tympanometry, well then they can do that and if they find that it's a classical sloping sensory neural hearing loss, that's fine. But if they find there's some asymmetry or the patient has other symptoms like pain, um, unilateral tinnitus, vitigo, uh, or have you know, otorrhea or signs of other disease, then they should really be investigated further and probably by an ENT surgeon to rule out um, acoustic neuromas and other similar problems and that's with a CT scan or an MRI. Yeah, now um, if a patient's coming down from the country and we've got kind of limited available CT, should we be doing that in the country or are you as the um, receiving specialist more likely to want something a little bit more contrast enhanced that can only be done in Perth? I think the wait list for MRIs in the public system is such uh, that it, it would make it difficult. And I think, for example, in the Kimberleys, you know, we have a CT scanner in, in, uh, coming up in Kununurra and they've got one in Broome. So I think uh, with the modern CT scanners, you're going to pick up any tumour or, uh, or condition that can shorten the life of the patient. And the main thing you're looking for is serious pathology. Yeah. So if you miss a a very, very small acoustic neuroma um, and the patient's problems progress, then I imagine they'll be looked at further down the track. So, yes, I think they can be done locally. Fabulous. Well, Harvey, thanks for joining us today. Do you have any last minute comments or take home messages for the GPs? Well, I think ear disease um, and, and hearing loss and speech delay, I think if you see a child that's two, that's got less than 10 words and is not talking in at least phrases, two word phrases, think uh, middle ear disease and, and also think other causes um, like uh, autism, um, pervasive developmental disorder and so forth. But for goodness sakes, refer them early so we're not seeing them at age three or later, which sometimes happens. So keep it on the radar, keep it on even the radar. if we think it's uh, autism or something else. I guess yes. they can easily coexist. Absolutely. Well, Harvey, thank you so much for your very practical tips today. Thank you very much, Olga. It's been the mindful. And that's all the time we have in this program. Thanks to all our guests for their time and to you for watching. We're back on the 4th of June with a program focusing on anxiety. And we'll also have a special edition webcast episode on OCD. I'm Jerry Gannon. As always, thanks for your company. <laughs>